Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Archives of American Arts Unboxed Lunch. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this is being recorded. I also want to gratefully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the indigenous ter territory of the Piscataway and Nakashtok peoples, as well as recognize the diverse native communities who make their home here today. My name is Nora, and we're thrilled you're joining us for lunch, which I'm enjoying here in the Archives Washington DC office. The Archives Gilbert and Ann Kinney New York collector Jacob Proctor is joining us from our Manhattan office. Today's event is all about the papers of critic and historian Michelle Cohn, which Jacob will be exploring with all of you in just a few minutes. We're very excited to have the subject of this episode of Unboxed Lunch in attendance today. So please chime in, Michelle, where you'd like in the chat. Before we get started, I want to go over, go over a few housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions for Jacob, which I will read to him as he uncovers materials for the collection from the collection. To submit a question, you can just type it into the chat or the Q&A, uh, which you will find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So without further ado, I'd like now to introduce Jacob Proctor, Gilbert and Ann Kinney, New York Collector at the Archives of American Art. Oh, you're on mute, Jacob. There we go. There we go. Okay, there we yeah. go. You'd think that after all those months, <laughs> there would be no more uh, mute, mute, <laughs> mute fails. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, as Nora said, my name is Jacob Proctor and I'm the Gilbert and Ann Kinney New York Collector for the Archives. I'm here in, our, uh, in my office um, in Manhattan and behind me and around me are the papers of Michelle Cohn. Um, here's a picture of Michelle for those of you who, who don't know what she looks like. This is, I think, from the late 80s. Um, and I, this is a, um, it's great to have Michelle on the, on the Zoom today. Um, hopefully she can correct, uh, correct me if I, if I mix up any dates uh, or facts or can chime in along the way. Um, this was um, actually one of the first collections from an individual that I collected during the pandemic. Um, otherwise I had been sort of focusing a little bit more on either uh, estates or institutions or galleries. Um, and so this was an interesting case where, um, you know, I was actually in Michelle's uh, home office going through papers with her usually one or two days a week for, I don't know, three or four weeks in a row. And so it was really wonderful to actually get to know her while I was getting to know her papers. Um, I knew her work uh, as a historian primarily. I knew her, her two books on the art before, during, and after the Vichy regime uh, and the, during the Nazi occupation um, of France and various articles um, and essays um, uh, around that sort of same sort of French modernist subject matter. Um, but what I actually didn't realize um, and I, I guess I had read a few things along the way, but I didn't really think of think of it until I started going through the papers was that before becoming an art historian, she had a whole long career as a critic. Um, so I'm gonna start there. Um, and so Michelle uh, graduated, was raised in France and originally educated in France, came to the United States, um, graduated from Bryn Mawr College uh, in the early 1950s, moved, um, eventually moved back to Europe um, with her husband, um, Sidney Cohn, um, who incidentally is the great nephew of the Baltimore Cohn sisters, interestingly, um, and lived in Paris and were, lived in, Bel in Brussels and studied and started writing cultural criticism um, while there. She returned to the US in 1968, in the fall of 68, um, and quickly, pretty quickly, I think, came into contact with Harold Rosenberg, the, um, the American critic, writer, teacher, um, theorist who famously uh, coined the term action painting for what eventually we came to call abstract expressionism. Um, and they became quite close and sort of under his influence, one might say, um, he, she wrote a book called Roots and Roots, R-O-O-T-S, like the tree, and roots like an airplane. 
um, of 20th century art, um, which was a kind of survey of 20th century art, which uh, was published in, in 1975. Um, and we have, um, you know, there are a lot of drafts and notes for various texts. I'm not gonna, it's not sort of the most uh, appropriate to this context, but there are a few things that are really interesting in terms of this, this early relationship. And some of it is a, there are a several, um, there's a little packet of letters um, from Harold Rosenberg uh, to Michel. Um, a lot of, most of them starting in the spring of 1969, um, and going up into the 1970s. Um, and I'll just pull out just at random one from May of 1969. Um, and this one, you know, it's written on his University of Chicago uh, letterhead, which is interesting. Uh, he has a, a few different letterheads from U of C. Um, and here's, an, here's another one from his, uh, his New Yorker. Um, letterhead and most of them are are either from his U of C where, uh, where he was a professor in, in the community and social thought um, uh, up until his death or the New Yorker where he was of course the main art critic for quite a long time and you can really see in these letters like this kind of wonderful intellectual friendship um, like a really intense intellectual friendship developing between to critics of very different generations. Um, and they're very, they're, they're very sweet um, as well. There's also a nice um, envelope here of photographs of Rosenberg from, um, I think this is a seminar he was teaching. This is in 1976, 77. So not, not long before his death. Um, and there, there, there's quite a few of these. Um, there's also, there are some other photographs of, of Rosenberg from various points. It was kind of nice. There's a, a photo that was um, from the Guildhall Museum in East Hampton of Hedda Stern's um, portrait of, of Rosenberg. Um, so, and I think you can also see, for those of you who will, are reading or have written or, or have read, read her criticism, I, I think that especially in the early criticism, you can, you can kind of see the influence there. Um, but it's really nice to have um, all of these letters. There's also some, you know, there's a lot of, there's actually really nice, there's nice correspondence in this collection. Um, there are also, there are a few letters um, here from the, uh, the French curator, Pierre Restoni, who was really the sort of the, one of the, one of those who developed um, the, this one is from um, the idea of nouveau realisme. With artists like Christo and Armand and Yves Klein, um, this is a postcard from from Restoni, actually, and this it's all in French. So, um, but I'll just paraphrase a little. It's basically it's all it's written sort of on the occasion of his hearing of the that Rosenberg himself had had passed away, um, and so it's dated um, late nineteen seventy eight. Um, I think we have a question here about um, the papers of other critics and historians we have at the archives. Uh -huh. What some examples of those and what that looks like? Yeah, it's actually it's an area that we've been collecting um, for a long time, uh, quite a long time, in fact. Um, and in the archives, we have the papers of about 150 art critics, um, and then we have about 40 more oral histories. Sometimes with the same uh, with the same critic whose papers we have. Um, so I mean, some notable we have Clement Greenberg, Gregory Batcock, Lucy Lepard, um, Susie Gablick, Robert Pincus Witten, um, Gene Swenson, Arthur Danto. I mean, there's a it's a long list, and a lot of these critics we also have oral histories um, with with them. We actually have two oral histories. Uh, with Harold Rosenberg, for example, although the bulk, and we have some papers relating to Rosenberg, although the bulk of his papers are at the Getty Research Institute. Um, so it is an area that we have a lot of depth and, um, and continue obviously to collect. Um, and related, we also have about, um, we have about 300 collections of papers of our historians. And so in, in Michelle's case, um, she, she's, she's both. 
Um, she's both an art historian and a critic. And so she fits into both of those categories. Thank you, Jacob. Sure. There's also a question I want to, um, since I'm here. Um, it's a question about, did Ms. Cohn write about and know Nikki de Saint Fall? I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Since we're talking about Pierre Ristini and the Nouveau Realists. So that's a question that you can address. And Michelle, if you'd like to chime in, you can address too. Yeah, um, I, I'm not aware of, I haven't read anything of her specifically about Nikki de Saint Fall, but I also haven't read all of her criticism. Um, and uh, it would, it, it is of course the same context uh, and Michelle can probably answer yes or no on this. Um, but there is, um, I should say there's, there's, you know, when she first moved to the US, she actually ended up writing a lot about things happening in France you know, or writing like, so for example, for the New York, she covered the, the, there was a very early, I think it maybe was the first of the Duchamp exhibition at, at the Centre Pompidou in Paris in the mid seventies. And Michel wrote about that for the New York Times. Um, and in the same way, she was writing about goings on in New York for French publications. Um, and so she was a kind of cultural go-between in this kind of very obviously pre-internet uh, moment. And there's some nice, um, examples of this in the papers of like this kind of art criticism like letter from New York that used to happen where you know a critic would kind of round up right you know sort of write a little overview of what was happening in a given city and then send it off to their editor in a different you know somewhere else and it's kind of after the fact and of course now we just have all of this coming at us constantly through social media um there's also, this was a surprise, a couple of, a couple of really wonderful surprises um, in this collection of correspondence. Um, the first was this little packet here with, with his little uh, uh, string tied around them. And these are all uh, letters and postcards. There's quite a few of them um, that, that were sent um, by a gentleman named Larry Rinder. Um, and what I hadn't realized is that um, I was like, what are all these letters from Larry Rinder? And she said, oh, he was my student at School of Visual Arts. So he was uh, a student at SVA and I, I didn't know this about him. I know him uh, from being a prominent curator at the Whitney, for example, and at the Berkeley Art Museum where he was also the director for several years or as the Dean of the California College for the Arts in San Francisco. And so essentially as a very prominent um, sort of member of the, the art world establishment. But here we have some like amazing letters uh, from a very young, <laughs> from very young Larry Rinder. And this was great where there are two of these um, where the letters are written on the, here's the letter, on the backs of, um, of, adver of essentially, homemade uh, posters um, advertising um, performances. And I had no idea that he had been uh, a performance artist. And so he's talking about them. Um, he's like describing like, what his plans and what else he had been doing. Um, and so these are really fantastic. Um, they're, and there's two, two more, I'll just, I won't read, there's a lot of them. But there's a couple that I think are really uh, are really great. One is I found in this is uh, a you know when you used to make a carbon copy of letters when you wrote on a typewriter, and this is a letter um, it's from 1982, um, and it's basically a very glowing review of Larry Rinder who is applying for graduate school and graduate fellowships, um, and about how he's most brilliant participant in all of these discussions. And I think this is really a, a pretty fantastic little document. And then finally, a postcard um, from Larry of the, uh, the Grand Duchess Maria Theresa of Luxembourg. And this is, Dear Michelle, I'm sorry I wasn't able to come to Paris. My trip was cut short and I was left with only three hours um, at Documenta, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that an, that's not even the postcard I wanted. Ah, this is the one. Mother wants, this is a, on the back of a Manet drawing. Uh, 
mother wants to visit palaces. I want to pick up guys. So far, we seem to, to be able to have it both ways from Vienna. Um, so that was a real, that was a kind of wonderful uh, surprise. And then another interesting surprise in the correspondence was a packet, a little packet um, of letters. Um, here's one of them. Of course, these are these ones are all in French. Look at that beautiful French script um, of letters um, to Michel from um, the composer Eliane Radic, um, who this is this is a photo of the two of them. Let's see if we can get it to focus. There we go. A photo of the two of them in Michelle's apartment in New York in 19, in the 70s at some point. Um, and this was really interesting to come across because uh, I actually just um, learned quite a bit about Elaine Radig in a new documentary um, by uh, Lisa Rovner called Sisters with Transistors, which is all about sort of women pioneers uh, in the field of electronic music. And Elaine Radig, uh, was featured in this and is, she was a student of Pierre Schaeffer and uh, Pierre Henry at the at Radio France uh, Music Concrete workshop um, and there are interviews with her and everything. So I, I recommend looking up, but that was a really, really nice to find. It's nice to see when people have uh, connections to artists and uh, people outside of like the visual art world. What else? There's also, you know, there's a lot of for the for the. There's also a lot of sort of more, more businessy correspondence. This is a whole folder of correspondence with Barry Schwabsky, um, who uh, from the time that in the late '80s and early '90s that she was writing for the Nation, um, where she was their uh, their uh, their Paris correspondent, and this this is this one's about adding her to the masthead. Um, but there's also interesting discussions back and forth between the two of them about various story ideas or um, sort of editorial uh, back and forth um, between the two of them. And I like that because Barry's also my editor um, <laughs> in my capacity as a critic often. Uh, so that was nice to see. Jacob, could you speak a little bit more about, I think people are curious about um, that, the process of, you mentioned, um, going and being with Michelle for over a period of a, of a few weeks and, and going through those papers and what that, you know, the beginning of that relationship looks like. Yeah, I mean, in this case, um, if I remember correctly, Michelle had been in touch a little bit with my predecessor in this job with Annette Letty. And I was, uh, and so when we got in touch, they had had, a, I think, just a brief conversation. Um, and then I was, uh, I was quite intrigued. And one of the first things that she mentioned were all of these, which is actually the next thing I was gonna show, um, which is a group of, uh, a collection of, of audio tapes of recorded interviews that she made mostly during the 1980s. Um, and I of course also knew her work as a historian. So I was, I was sort of intrigued at this, at learning this kind of, like the person who I knew as a writer on Vichy France, also interviewed, you know, Heim Steinbach and Robert Gober and Jeff Koons in the mid eighties. Um, so that was the initial, I was like, huh, I would like to go to see this. And so of course we had a little back and forth about how comfortable we would be with COVID. And, um, and of course it's sort of strange because, you know, to spend all this time with someone and never see the bottom half of their face. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was quite, we had a few fun conversations and then I just started going and it was, you know, it's just, sort of a big spacious studio apartment that's used as an office. So there was, there was plenty of room for us to be there. Um, but I do wanna show these, which are great. So this is one of the, this was, these were originally in a shoebox, although I have rehoused them uh, in a more archival uh, setting in the last few days. Um, and when Michelle in the mid eighties was the New York editorial coordinator for flash art, um, and writing a lot of criticism and for other magazines as well. One of the things she did was she interviewed a lot of artists um, and other people as well, but in particular the artists. And so I was just totally blown away um, when I saw, when I came through this because um, a few of these have been published, but not that many. And the, when, the ones that have been published are, you know, it's like in an art magazine, so it hasn't actually, so there, which means that it's been really heavily edited usually. 
And often these are, I mean, I assume that they're much longer in terms of the recordings because that's how tape recording interviews work. But so for example, like here's, here's Peter Halley and um, come on, focus. So strange. Yeah, uh, that worked. Peter Halley in uh, 1985, um, or there's three tapes of Heim Steinbach, um, one of which uh, ends with Steinbach, and then it's then it has Gober um, picks up, uh, and so then there's another recorded a recording with Barbara Gober, and then I was really interested that. Um, that there's also um, this recording here of Katie Noland in 1989. And this is actually an interview that um, was published in a magazine called The Journal of Art. And I think it's one of the, it's one of the Nolan, Katie Noland interviews that gets recorded um, or gets reproduced relatively often. Um, and it's a very good interview. And so to have the actual full tape of this interview is um, kind of an amazing thing. Um, I personally can't wait to, <laughs> to listen to it. Um, and there's also, along with these, there's a bunch of, there's, there's some photographs um, that, you know, sort of of a bunch of these artists. This is a book launch for Michelle's book um, on Vichy. Uh, and there's Peter Halley um, right there. Um, and there's Katie, Michelle and Katie Noland. Um, you know, or there's uh, in the middle there is Christo, and there actually are two tape, two full tapes, I think, of interviews uh, with Christo um, in different contexts. And also, Michelle wrote a very early piece on Christo in '76, I think, about running fence, um, which was published in the Atlantic. Um, so that was really interesting. One of these interviews actually is already in our collection. I realized where she interviewed Roy Lichtenstein in the 1970s. Um, and that interview was subsequently digitized by the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation and included in their donation of the Lichtenstein papers to us. So we actually already have one of these. Um, that that um, harkens to a couple of questions that are juicy questions that have come up. Here's one and it's about is the, um, the norm receiving materials from deceased individuals or living individuals or is it a pretty even split? It's a pretty mm -hmm. even split. It really depends. I mean, right. both happen a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's a question about um, if these papers, if papers are cross-referenced. So for example, if we have Larry Rinder's paper, if we had really Rinder's papers, would they include the information that his letters to Michelle are in her papers? Well, they would be tagged. So, right. you know, as they're being processed by our archivists, they would, you know, he would be tagged, you know, in as a in her papers and vice versa. If like, say, if he had letters from her um, in his papers, we don't have his papers. Although, Larry, if you're watching, give me a call. <laughs> um, the uh, so, yeah, there there is like at this point, the, when, when things become processed, they, they those cross references are, are built in. Right. Um, and in Michelle's case, also, there's something else that happens where um, if the paper, if there's another significant portion of someone's papers in another institution, we would note that as well. And so in this case, there are files, there are research files for her Vichy work, but she had already several years ago donated a big chunk of Vichy, re original Vichy research to Special Collections Library at Columbia. So we would, we would note in our, you know, that, that we have some Vichy material, but that a lot of it is, is with Columbia. Right. And hopefully vice versa. Right. And that's another one of these, the questions in the Q&A here is about how, if there's sort of like a competition for these types of papers among institutions and how the archives, um, what it means to work with the archives of American art at the Smithsonian and um, how people make that decision. And I mean, we can make a really good case for it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, sometimes there, I mean, often there is, not always. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I mean, working with the archives uh, is, you know, I mean, you're working with essentially with the national collection. Um, and we are, you know, we're the largest archive of our kind um, by far. 
uh, and oldest. We are the oldest, and we're by far the most accessible. You know, we really try to make everything uh, as available as possible to to the public, and make the process of researchers accessing materials as easy as possible. Um, yeah, there's uh, that's, but of course, you know, there's always friendly uh, friendly competition. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about these recordings that's, that people might be a little surprised by um, and was a surprise to me, which is that, you know, Michelle was doing, she was working on her PhD for most of the 80s. She finished it in 88 and she was doing it in, in the really writing a kind of cultural history, which also is an art history um, in the French department um, at NYU. Uh, and she was very heavily involved with the Maison Francaise and as a result, every time, it seemingly every time some notable French intellectual came through the Maison Francaise and gave a talk or a panel or whatever, she would record it. So there are also, in addition to all these artists, there are recordings of Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, Philippe Soer, um, you know, like all kinds of different people. And so this is actually a really interesting also document of the intersection of contemporary art and French theory in the 1980s um, within these papers as well. So, and also here's a, I'll just show you, here's like a photograph of, I don't know why it works for your hand back, but of Michel with, uh, with Roland Barthes um, in I think I don't know, 86 uh, maybe. Um, so anyway, that's also here and will be, is a kind of unusual thing to have in, the, in a collection like this. That's great. So we have someone asking about also uh, any of are any of the files or tapes digitized and where they would be available. And that answer is not yet because we just got them. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can say a little bit more about that about what the time you know how that works at the archives. Yeah, I mean usually like well, I mean under normal circumstances, uh, I mean we we do digitize. Um, I, I don't know whether this is about papers or about tapes, um, but we digitize both. We actually are in the process right now of digitizing a thousand audio recordings um, through with the American Folklife Center. Um, so hopefully, I, would, I mean, I am personally very, very anxious to get some of these tapes uh, digitized and transcribed. Um, in this case, I mean, in every case, they first have to be kind of assessed by our conservators for condition um, because you know media degrades just like anything else. Um, but the answer is kind of hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, once there's a finding aid, you know, we'll produce a finding aid usually within two years, you know, and sometimes less. Um, once there's a finding aid, then researchers can find out what's in the collection and they can speed up the process of digitiz digitization by requesting specific folders to be digitized along the way. Right. And we have um, a, along with our collections plans, we have, you know, our, um, our head of collections processing sets up a, um, a workflow and a schedule that's, you know, months, if not years in advance. So that's, uh, that's how things are sort of um, monitored and they lay, laid out for schedules. But if you have questions, more questions about digitization or um, when things like other media, like tapes and things like that are, uh, are digitized and available online or digitally, you can definitely reach out to me. My email is in the chat, I believe, yes. Um, and I can pass along your question to whoever might be able to answer it um, best. But I wanna thank you, Jacob. And thank you everyone for joining us for Unbox Lunch today. Um, support from friends like you makes it possible for us to share collections like Michelle Cohn's with curious people around the world. If you'd like to let, if you'd like to know more about your gift being uh, recognized in an installment of Unbox Lunch, you can contact me, Nora Daniels, at the email that my colleague put in the chat. Chat. It's DanielsN at si.edu. And to support the work of our collectors and archivists, please visit aaa.si.edu/support, and you can support them there, twenty-four-seven. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you next month and enjoy this summer that is here.
it's spring and it's very quickly becoming summer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.